Yeah. And and so it's obvious that it becomes a really important thing for for the interpretation of their own history. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that people in ancient Israel were concerned about it. And so like there's that difference between what the elite, the people that were able to make texts um wanted to say is is the reason for things happening. What they told people was the reason for things happening and the actual things happening on the ground. Like, like, I mean, one of the things that people, that archaeologists use to define Israelite settlements from the, from the Iron Age is the presence of house goddesses, like little deities, little, little statues. Like, that's one of the defining features of, of Israelite things because they're, because they're just everywhere. And so, like, we, we, we know that there was this stuff going on. And, and what the theological texts of the Hebrew Bible are doing is trying to say, darn it, we should, we should have known better. Right. And, yeah. and, and I mean, and Asherah is also a, a great example because like, so like up until the 1800s or early 1900s, like basically scholars thought Asherah was Asherah poles. Like it was just, there was some kind of thing called an Asherah pole and that, that's basically it, like probably some kind of goddess worship thing. And, and then they discovered the Ugaritic texts. And, and so there's a goddess named Athira, or, which is the same as Asherah. So the Ash and the Th are basic, are cognates. So, and, and, and then we found that, okay, well, she actually was a goddess at, at Ugarit, so in Canaanite religion. And so then it's like, oh, and she happens to be the consort of either El or Baal. And everybody's like, oh, wow, okay. So yeah, maybe she was a, a more important deity. So it's the wife of Baal's wife or El's wife or something. That's a, that's a big deal. And then scholars uncovered a text uh, uh, like more recently that literally says Yahweh and his Asherah. And which, which like, which, which is just, a, it seems to connect them also as being in a divine relationship, right? right? And and then it's like, oh, so maybe, maybe Yahweh was also just, you know, a not a, you know, not the only god, but he was a god with his own goddess wife and his own god family, and and then it like makes you again just step back and say, oh, well, Hebrew Bible is is a Canaanite text. It is something that makes sense in its context. And and then it's like trying to sort out where they move from the idea of obviously there are lots of gods and obviously Yahweh is a part of this, this divine council and this divine family to saying, no, no, it's just the one guy. Like that, that's what's become the interesting question. Yeah. And in, on, so the word Asherah sort of gets connected with the word yeah. wife somehow. Is that, is that what happened? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So like, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that. Um, but it's, um, but it's, it becomes like, she becomes the wife of the gods. Like yeah. that's kind of her function. Yeah. Got you. Now yeah. I, 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 I can't help but to wonder because Canaan, we see all this borrowing from the Babylonians and Sumerians and Akkadians. And but Canaan, if you look at its history, it was part of the Egyptian sphere for a thousand years, maybe longer. Yeah. And it makes you wonder why didn't they, uh, even as a polemic, you, you don't see them ever talking about Osiris or Isis. No, I don't even know if they ever talk about Amon really. Like they don't, they don't really talk about the Egyptian deities. They're just trying to stay away from that. No, well, so. Uh what I would say is that is a really good argument for a late dating of a lot of the texts in the Hebrew Bible. Right. So the Babylonian connection, we know the historical framework for a Babylonian connection. And, um, and, and so when you have such a polemic, such a strong push towards the Babylonian, then you have to think that we're talking about the, you know, at least from the, from the, you know, the late eighth, early seventh century with the Assyrians and then the Babylonian influence after the sixth century. And so it's just like, for me, that's, that's like a really good reason to say, like, we're, we're not talking about the, the thousands BC or whatever, yeah. when, when Egypt is really controlling the Levant. We're talking like 500 BC here, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. The more I look into this, the more I'm starting to realize this is not as old as we think it is. 
right. it's based off older texts, but this is written, or I should say compiled. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, there's, and there's definitely older traditions and there's, there's like, there is definitely Egyptian influence on, on the old Testament. And, and like, I mean, so, and, and, and it's, it is really interesting when you bring that up, because like, if we look at archeology, span we see that there are these seals, like these Royal seals and, and then these impressions or scarabs or whatever they're called, like these impressions of Royal seals that are found and they show very clear Egyptian influence. Yeah, I've seen those. I, I, I saw the Ankh symbol on the Hezekiah stone. Yes, exactly. I was like, what? Like, yeah. this, this is Egyptian, but yeah, it's definitely Egyptian. But it's also like, I mean, and so that's like with Hezekiah. That is a time when literally, like, the Bible says that he asked for help from Egypt, right? I mean, so like these kings are uh, just before Hezekiah, and with Hezekiah, they're they're trying to stave off an invasion from the Assyrians, and they're like they're looking for support from behind from the Egyptians. And and so there probably was some kind of a, a union there, right? That kind of lasted for a while, but then it falls apart at, at, at some point. Right. Yeah. And, and so, but, and, and like, there's been a lot of talk, like, I mean, this is, and this is like for hundreds of years, this idea that, um, that, that the idea of monotheism comes from Egypt. Right. And, and so that's, I mean, that, that's also one of those things where it's really hard to say, whether or not there actually has been that kind of influence, because it's at such an ideological level that we we can't see it so clearly. Um, but but again, that that's like one possible way that we could see it in the in the realm of the divine. Um, but but again, it's not like the names of the gods just aren't there. Like I mean, it's just we we see we see reflexes of so many more you know Mesopotamian gods. Um, than than you would expect if it was kind of divided evenly in the history between Egyptian influence and Mesopotamian influence. Yeah, and I, I like to a lot of times people compare the monotheistic, the Aten worship, and say that's where it all came from. Yeah, but, but then you also have the Zoroastrians and Ahura Mazda. But if I'm, the more I look at that, the, the Zoroastrians they don't seem to be really pure monotheistic at all because they still have they still have Mithra as the mediator. They still yep. have Iraman and they still have all these it seems like there's just it, it's not really pure monotheism it's just like a closer to it that right makes yeah but but I do think like chronologically that kind of monotheism or whatever we want to call it, henotheism or sure. whatever like because it's not it's not I mean monotheism I mean what's that like I don't believe most modern Christians are monotheists either I don't think most I don't think it I, I mean I think it's really hard to find somebody that could be like a pure monotheist that that doesn't believe in any other kind of divine influence than than the one soul God or whatever and that's almost deism at that point because yeah, yeah. it all comes from one source that's you're almost you're almost outside of theism at that point, right? Right, and that's why it's such an um, it's such an anachronism to to kind of talk about monotheism at that point. But to say that there's like one high god that that is kind of more important or, or whatever than than all the others, and that everything else is subject to, then I think like Zoroastrianism actually provides more chronologically relevant and geographically relevant parallel than the Aten stuff and the Egyptian stuff because it, it we, we just don't know and and that was also an older generation of biblical scholars that that would postulate that because they really wanted the Egyptian influence to be real yeah right because they're saying like Moses was there and he came and they would fight about whether it was 1400 or 1200 or whatever when Moses did this and difference. that Right, two hundred years is a long time. Right, and where we're now, we're just kind of like, yeah, no. Right, um, no, that makes a lot of sense, especially yeah. when you look at how short-lived the Aten thing was. Yeah, Akhenaten did his thing, and then his son ruled, and that was it. That was the end of Aten. Exactly. It went right back to Osiris and Isis right after that. For the next exactly, time. and and that it was like it was so unpopular. Right. That that they were they were like deposed and and it and it disappeared. So it wasn't like it was a something that that the people wanted. It doesn't seem to be like a a massive success. And then everybody was like, "Man, I can't believe the king died." Now these other polytheistic kings are coming back. And it's like it yeah, it just didn't work like that. Right. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So so getting back to sort of these these sky father deities their yep. etymologies 
Um, what do you think? Is there any interesting things that you've noticed that most people aren't aware of? Maybe. Well, so I can I can tell you about my favorite um, of the uh, of the Sumerian Akkadian deities. Um, like this one is like this is kind of like for me this was like blow your mind kind of kind of thing um, because there there's a so there's this story of of um, Anki or or the god uh, the god Anki or or Ea and and uh, the goddess Ninhursag who are who's like the, she, uh, that means like the goddess of the holy mountain or something like that the sacred mountain but but so like they're kind of the primordial god parents in this in this story and and basically like there's this it's it's just this really it's a really weird story but so they like they they do their thing and they have a daughter and then like the goddess nin Hursag is out doing something and and then enki sees the daughter and thinks it's the mother and then like they do the thing and then there's a another daughter and they go through this like line where it just keeps happening and happening and happening right he, he keeps making new daughters with the one he thinks is is the, is the mother and and so like we it's just really weird but then anyway so like they it ends up like um that they the 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 mother Nin Hursag comes back and says, like, you have to wipe the seed of Anki off you. And and so she like wipes it off her. And then like these seven plants grow. And and so these seven plants, obviously seeds, right? It's a good like uh, play on words. And and so this this these seeds grow into trees or plants. And and so Anki comes around, he finds them, he's like, Oh, I want to eat that. And so he eats them and he becomes death. Uh, and then I don't don't remember if it's because of the plants or if it's because Nin Hursag gets really mad at him. But like anyway, he gets deathly ill. Like I think she gives him the evil eye, and then he he falls deathly ill. And and then like so she you know she runs off, and he's really really sick, and everybody's like, oh, you have to come and save him. And and so then she comes back to save him, and like kind of lays him in her lap, and starts to do this thing, and she creates like the the cool gods from him. Like by taking parts of him and and like fixing him, healing him, but then also to in order to save him, and and so like the god of beer and things like that just shows up then. But one of the goddesses that is created is in um, in Sumerian is called Ninti, and Ninti um, is it, this is the like blow your head off kind of thing. It's like it's amazing. Um, so she is created by Nin Hursag removing one of Anki's ribs. Okay. Yeah. Oh no, we're not done yet, my friend. Oh, no. We're not done yet. <laughs> and so and so this Nin T is created, right? And she then has like the, you know, the healing power and it's part of this healing thing of, of Anki. Well, well, T in Sumerian means means rib right and and the sumerian sign um that we can we can look at if you want um is like it's like it looks like an arrow and and it points straight through so it's this really cool sign and and it's also used for an it's also used for arrow but it's used for for rib but t has another meaning which is giver of life wow and so nin t in this myth is the lady of the rib who is the goddess who gives life. Wow. Now, when you then read Genesis. The Genesis story, right? And we have the woman created from the rib, and her name then is Chava, which literally in Hebrew means she who gives life, like wow. giver of life. Wow. Yeah. It's like... There's so much of this happening in the, in the, in the Hebrew yeah. Bible. Yeah. And so like the, the Semitic language itself comes from these same roots. So yeah. you have there is it's inescapable that you're going to have these sort of little puns happening. Exactly. And and like I mean it's just so obvious that that this is playing on that mythology, right? That there's a that there is a an understanding of this underlying creation from the rib, the god that is that is, you know, he, his salvation is in the in the removal of the rib and and then you have the giver of life and I mean it's just it's just so clear and 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 for me, it's just like that was one of those things. I remember like reading that the first time I read that that myth, and was just sitting there like, you know, 
why did why didn't I read that in Sunday school? You know, like that's that that is that's some cool stuff. It is. It is. Yeah. It actually makes the text more profound. I think. Yeah, definitely. They're, they're keeping their tradition going back to the beginning of of all time. Like they're yep. they're like and they and that's what they sort of, the text sort of makes you want to feel like this book is from all the way back to Adam and it's yep. like okay, but we know it's not. But then when you find out stuff like this, you're like. Well, maybe they do have some sort of claim to the to the earliest days of history because they're holding on to these stories and they're repurposing them. I think it makes it better. I think it's something that people should be proud of of their of their uh, texts, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it's 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 an amazing literary accomplishment. I yeah. like. I mean, to say that, like, like Literally, that yeah. to take that kind of myth and reframe it and then make it into part of the story of of where your people come from right that's like that is exactly what what i think is cool like that reception of it and transformation of it into being my story or our story instead of just being that story out there and so it's obviously crafted right and so like i mean it's all fake it's all made up right. but but it's it's made at least then it's made up for us or whatever you know and like it makes it much cooler yeah now you now you back to that story that's fascinating you said there were mm -hmm. seven seven deities created out of this yes what are the, what are the other ones if you, if you do you remember or no i i I do remember some of them. Let me see. Um, so, so there's the goddess of beer um, is is my favorite. That's Nin Nin Kossi is her, is her name. Um, I think so. Yeah, one one of them is called Abu, which means father, and and oh, wow. that is the that's the the god of of like growth and and plants and stuff like that. Um, then you have um, I think there's like the god of um, so there's the god of of like um, what do you call them like smiths like blacksmiths or metal workers or whatever. Um, you have the goddess of healing, um, and then there is the uh, oh. What, do you remember I, the name of the heal, healing goddess by by any chance? So there's there. Um, I think it's Nin Situ. Um, so. Um, yeah, that's like so. Sit, sit, situ would be her her title. Like Nin is is the word for goddess, or or I mean, it means lady, or, or that's how it's usually translated. But it means like it means goddess. So, um, yeah. Um, and then, yeah. So, but I think also there's the the goddess um, Az, 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 Azimu or something like that. Azimu, uh, who is who's also a god of healing, but who is the she, so her, I think she's like the consort of the the god of the of the dead or of the the nether world or whatever. So like, there's yeah, there's a whole like there's a whole pile of mythologies there, and and like n these aren't necessarily the most well known or the most like um, like integrated of the of the myths, right? But like they're they're part of of this story anyway. Like it's it, it's an important part of that that kind of creation epic. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now that's now, and you mentioned how the the names can mean two different things. Mm, yeah. And I talked to some other people about this too. It seems like the Sumerians really had a thing with puns. Well, I think I think it. Yeah, I mean, definitely, you see it in their in their literary works, but like, I think it's also a product of the so the structure of the language and the writing system, because like the the language is, we don't know it hundred. I mean, we don't know hundred percent sure how Sumerian actually was. We we have some ideas, but like, it's written in cuneiform, which is which is not uh, an alphabet. It's it's either logograms which are just word by word or their syllables and so like you you don't always know exactly how the language would have been spoken but the the writing at least reflects some of the words and the ways they they would have been like we we got a pretty good idea but it's not like it we, we don't always know everything but like you will get things like this where there obviously must have been homophones in the language 
like with T, where it could mean uh, uh, rib or life. And, and so like, it seems like that this combination between trying to use symbols to, to show like as few symbols as possible to cover all the consonants and all the words and, and all this kind of stuff that there were associations made that like, it, it looks like that. And so we'll call it that, but you could also say that it looks like that. And so it gets that value as well. And, and so you get kind of these things that are very close and, and like when you get into later Akkadian, so Sumerian's older, but then Akkadian comes and takes over the writing system and takes over a ton of the words. Um, but like Akkadian's a completely different language. And so what happens in Akkadian right. is you get scribes that do this crazy stuff where they will choose the way they write things in Akkadian, like, so that they can play on what the Sumerian word behind the symbol means. And so you get these like ridiculous puns. Like, I mean, it's at a whole another level. And, um, wow. and, and they, I mean, it's, so it's, it's like, it is, it, there's some stuff that's just like, I mean, it is really advanced and they really knew what they were doing. And so that's like, for me, even more confirmation why things like this Eve and, and Ninti kind of thing, like it's, it's not a stretch for an ancient scribe to do that, a Mesopotamian scribe. And so if you have these Judean scribes that have learned Babylonian and they would have learned these tales, they would have learned to write like this and they could have easily done that kind of pun. Yeah. I know one of them I noticed recently, I was doing a video on the God Eshmon, the Phoenician mm -hmm. God. And from what I found out the the, the well, I, I know a little bit of Hebrew, so I already knew that the number eight is, is Shimone. Yeah. But the word shmon by itself, without the e, at, well, without the a at the end, it means oil. Yeah. So shmon, sh, sh, shmon is like a, a a name that means oil or a, the eighth. So he's right. like pun on he because he he's a healer. He uses oil, and then he's yep. also the eighth, the eighth son of Sada Sidak or whatever his name is. Yeah. So like, they're doing that. The Phoenicians are still doing that, and, the, yep. so, and they're not too far from the Judeans. They're sort of probably using the same sort of. Uh, tactics of scribe how the scribes do their thing you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah definitely and and i mean and again like i said earlier like that's like that's how we have to read the hebrew bible like the hebrew bible is a is a product of canaan in the in the iron age that's heavily influenced by mesopotamian culture so like i mean so the phoenicians their their language is very very similar to to hebrew it's i mean hebrew is a hebrew is a dialect of canaanite that that came into being in the late Bronze Age, so 14, 13, 1200, sometime like that. And and the oldest like Hebrew inscriptions, like you'll see people talking about, oh, we found the oldest Hebrew inscriptions or whatever. It's probably Canaanite. Like, I mean, yeah. we're because we get to a point where it's too early to be Hebrew. And and like that was also one of those moments that like my head exploded when I when I was studying Semitics and like we started working with historical linguistics and we're like we you get to that point where you're like, yeah, and Hebrew doesn't exist before this point. And and you're just like, wait, what? What? <laughs> and and like then before that it's Canaanite, right? And and so you start reading these Canaanite inscriptions, and it's like Oh yeah, that's that's really easy to understand. Like you have this vocal sh the vowel shift, or you have some changes and slightly different forms and stuff like that. But it's like you, you just get it, and 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 then as we work backwards, you know, you get like Ugaritic, which is you know obviously pre Hebrew Canaanite, and I mean it's 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 up on the coast of of um, Syria or Lebanon up there, but it's so close in terms of culture, in terms of language, that it's like, it's so easy to understand. And, and like one of the first like really big biblical scholars that got into Ugaritic, uh, Mitchell Dahud wrote this commentary on the Psalms where he basically just says like every, every word almost has a footnote that says, uh, this is Ugaritic, this is Ugaritic, this is Ugaritic. And it's like, it's such a fun commentary because he sees Canaanite stuff everywhere. Wow. And, and like, to the point that people would, I mean, like if he was uh, like present day, he would get memes made up about him, about being the, the Ugaritic guy, the Canaanite guy, but like it's, it's, and so it's a little overkill, but it's, it's definitely makes you aware that, that the Hebrew Bible is, is Canaanite. Sure. It's, it's, it's just, that's where it fits in. 
And yeah. so they are doing the same kind of things with the with the words and and like we see it when when you get like the folk etymology for for Yahweh, right? I mean, when you read when you read why Yahweh is Yahweh, the the reason for it is because of what he says to Moses, right? Where it says, um, um, uh, "Asher, uh, 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 yeah, um, yeah." It's uh, he like he says. Um, uh, which means I am that which I am, or I am who I am, right? And and so it's, but what it is is it's a funny thing because it's he uses a first person verb and says like I am uh, who I am or what I am, um, but then in the next verse he says and by the name Yahweh you will know me. And that's a third person verb. And so it's like, takes the the grammar of the language and says, oh, when I talk about myself, obviously I would use the first person form of my verbal name. But when you talk about me, you have to use the third person form of my name. And so Yahweh is a third person verb. And so it's just like, it's, it's playing on how they understand the name. As right. saying, that's when great. God uses it in his own mouth, it's first person, obviously. Duh. 